currently there are 129 million Americans, that's 52% of Americans, living with at least one preventable chronic disease. You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 179. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Welcome back, veggie lovers. Can you believe there's only one week left in the month of October? I can't believe it. Halloween's coming up. Do you celebrate Halloween? We do in our family, and I'm super excited that we are going to be doing the Mandalorian theme this year. I'm going to be Ahsoka Tano, my oldest, the Mandalorian, my youngest, Moff Gideon, and my husband, if he gets around to putting his costume together, will be Mayfield. So we're super excited. I'm actually going to make my own headpiece. It may end up being a Pinterest fail, we'll see. But I'm excited to get crafty because it'll be way cheaper and probably better looking than some of the ones I've seen online. So I hope that things are going well for you and that you are loving life right now and enjoying everything and staying healthy. As you know, we have been trucking along here at Veggie Doctor Radio bringing you weekly episodes. And I realized I give a lot of presentations and why not share them with you? So today I am going to give a presentation entitled, Why Nutrition is Important Now More Than Ever. And I actually gave this presentation to one of the local Rotary Clubs a couple of weeks ago. It's a short, shorter presentation. It's about 25, 30 minutes. It was meant, it was created as an interactive presentation, but obviously this is recorded, so you can't interact with it. But I'll read you the questions, and in your mind, you can select the answers when we have little quiz questions. So I hope that you enjoy it. Probably most of it is not going to be new information, but maybe it will inspire you, or this also might be a really good episode to share with family and friends that need a little bit more information on plant-based nutrition, what it is and why it benefits us and why it doesn't have to be all or nothing. So let's get started. Why nutrition is important now more than ever. So currently there are 129 million Americans, that's 52% of Americans, living with at least one preventable chronic disease. Chronic disease is responsible for seven out of 10 deaths in the United States. We are one of the wealthiest and most technologically advanced nations, yet we are dieting more than ever. We derive the least pleasure from our food and we have a high burden of chronic disease. So what does this mean? That means that we are being ineffective, we are being misdirected, we're confused about what to eat, we're trying to eat less because we wanna look a certain way, yet we're so unhealthy and we're dying young and it's not great. So this is the problem. And as you know, the number one cause of death in the United States is heart disease. And so that is in the top of the list as preventable chronic diseases, but on that list is also diabetes, dementia, stroke, those kinds of things. So why should we care about nutrition? Well, I wanna tell you 
why I care and what my goals are for when I make decisions for my own health. I help guide my patients and their families. I help guide my coaching clients and how I think about raising my own children and speaking to my own family about health. So why do I care? Number one, I care because I want to feel good now. I want to have that well-being. And that's what I define as well-being, as feeling well, being able to do the things I want to do, moving my body in a joyful manner, spending time with my friends and my family, my loved ones, doing the things I want to do, doing the activities, enjoying life. Number one, I want to have well-being. Number two, I want to decrease the risk of developing a preventable chronic disease. And I'm aware that nothing is all or nothing and we can't eliminate risk completely from life because life is about risk. But I'm also aware that there's choices that I can make that decrease my risk of developing one of these preventable chronic diseases that could end my life prematurely or can lead me to many years of unwell, ill health and disability. And then finally, I want to live a long and healthy life. I wanna live long and not just long, but I wanna live well. So for me, I don't think I want to be around if I'm spending a long time feeling bad, having pain, suffering from these diseases, and I'm not having the quality of life I want. So I know that I can make choices now to set myself up to live a healthy long life. So what about you? What do you want and what do you think about whenever you're thinking and reflecting on your life. So when you reflect on your life, do you want to A, live a long, healthy life by cultivating healthy habits, or B, play hard and die young, YOLO baby. You only live once, okay? So where are you? Are you more on, yeah, if I can, if I have the ability to, I wanna make choices to live that long, healthy life. So when it comes to chronic disease prevention, what we eat is the most important factor that we can control. There's so many different habits that are important. And there's so many different things we don't have control over, we may not be able to change. For example, we may not immediately or very quickly be able to change the amount of pollution that's in our air or the amount of some of the toxins that we're exposed to in the environment, you know, the amount of radiation we get from travel or sunlight, you know, we can do little things here and there, but there's some things that might be beyond our control. But when it comes to food, when it comes to diet, we have a lot of control over that. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But the other thing to keep in mind is that eating is a very repetitive thing. So we're eating usually at minimum three times, but I think the latest statistics show that we're eating about seven times a day. So seven times per day, we are choosing what to put in our bodies and we are exposing ourselves to things that may support our health or could potentially detract from our health. And so it's a constant thing, you know? So it is something that deserves to be thought about, that deserves for us to be mindful about it. And it contributes a lot to our health. The good news is, is that it's more simple than you think. Like I said before, we tend to overcomplicate things. We think we need a certain macronutrient count or percentage or get a certain amount of whatever and count things, but you don't have to. Really, all you need to do is eat more whole plant foods. Eat more whole plant foods. And it does not have to be all or nothing. So hopefully you are sighing in relief if you are not one that's ready to become vegan or 100% plant-based. 
You don't have to become completely plant-based, but you do have to eat more plants than the average American. Why? Because the standard American diet is composed of only about 10% whole plant foods. The majority of the calories that we're consuming in this country is coming from processed foods and animal products. Processed foods and animal products. Only about 10% actually is coming from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds in their whole or minimally processed form. That being said, I wanna make sure you understand what is a whole food plant-based diet so that it makes it even simpler for you. I wanna make this so simple for everybody. It is not complicated, okay? So let's start with what overall is a whole food plant-based diet. It is one that is composed of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds in their most whole form. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, I have an image here of the power plate that's created by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. As you can see, it's beautiful, it's colorful, it's got the fruits, grains, legumes, vegetables on there. And I like to add nuts and seeds too, because especially for our pediatric population, we wanna make sure that they're getting a variety of these foods, not just for nutrients, but to make sure that we're getting some more calorie dense foods in there for the littler ones, okay? so. In their most whole or minimally processed form, the majority of what you eat should be coming in that way. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, but let's talk about what is the difference between a whole or unprocessed food and a processed food? What is the difference? Well, I'm gonna give you some examples. Let's start with an apple. If you walk up to an apple tree and you pick an apple off of the tree that is a whole food it is in its most whole and intact form you just grab it maybe you wash it or wipe it off take a bite out of it you are eating a whole food okay minimally processed would be if you got that apple maybe cut it into slices threw the whole thing in the vitamix and made it into an applesauce with the peel on that would be minimally, minimally processed. You're not really doing much to it. You're changing the form of it. You might be changing the protein structure a little bit if you decide to cook it. Say you took that whole apple and you baked it. That would just be minimally processed. And we do cook a lot of our food. So a lot of our foods, even though they're whole, they're technically minimally processed. But you're not taking anything away from it and you're not adding anything to it, okay? So that's the difference. It's minimally processed, you changed it a little bit, but essentially all the components are there. So let's talk about moderately processed. An example would be apple juice, why? Because when you make apple juice, what you're doing is you're just squeezing the water and the sugar and some of the nutrients out and you're not including the peel or the pulp on the inside that also has some nutrients. So it's moderately processed because you're actually taking some things away. The most notable thing in the case of apple juice is you're taking away fiber, which we will talk about in a second because I love talking about fiber. But also moderately processed might mean you're adding something to it. So you might be adding some salt, you might be adding some sugar, but we know that moderately processed means we're taking things away or we're adding things or maybe a little bit of both. The next category is ultra processed. In the apple example, the example would be Apple Jacks, Apple Jacks cereal. When I gave this presentation live, it, I just showed a picture of it and everybody immediately recognized it. So you know that they probably ate Apple Jacks in their childhood and I must admit that I did from time to time. It was not my favorite cereal. My favorite, just so that everybody can take note, was Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Very delicious cereal, but now when I eat it, it kind of tastes a little bit gummy and it sticks to my palate and of course leaves sores in my mouth just like Captain Crunch does. But this is an example of an ultra processed food. What is an ultra processed food? Well, not only are things taken away and things are added, but you're adding artificial things. You're adding artificial colors, dyes. You're adding artificial flavors. And it is so unrecognizable that when you looked at that food, obviously people recognize it because they remember this from their childhood, but say you just came from another planet 
you wouldn't know what that is. It may look like its own thing. You wouldn't know that maybe there's apple in there because it looks nothing like an apple. So this is an ultra processed food. Another definition that I give to people of ultra processed food is it is something that you can't make at home. It has to be made in a factory. I wouldn't even begin to know how to make Apple Jacks at home and make it look like they would in the factory. So it's not something that you can easily make at home, it requires machines. In the case of cereals, they have this special machine that puffs out certain types of cereal and makes them puffs, things like that. But then you're doing all of these chemical concoctions to give it the colors and flavors. And I just have the ingredients list here for Apple Jacks. The first ingredient is a corn flour blend, which one of, you know, then it has parentheses. It, yeah, it does have some whole grain yellow corn flour, but it also has degerminated yellow corn flour. And I don't know what percentage of that, probably degerminated is the bigger percentage. And they threw in the whole grain yellow corn flour just to say that there's whole grains in there, but it probably isn't that much. And that's taking things away. You're taking the germ away from the whole grain, which means that you're taking away some fat, some nutrients, uh, excellent uh, vitamins and minerals that whole grains typically have. Of course, the second ingredient is sugar. Then you have some wheat flour, whole grain oat flour. Then you see like 10th or 11th on the list, dried apples and apple juice concentrate, <laughs> okay? So it's called Apple Jacks, but it has very little apples. In addition, you've got some yellow number six, you've got yellow number five, you've got red 40, you've got blue one. And then of course they added all of these vitamins and minerals. This is called an enriched food. If you watched or you follow me on Instagram, I did a few little uh, reels where I talked about what enriched means. Enriched means that whenever you process a food, and this happens a lot for grains, you're taking away the germ, you're taking away the parts that have the nutrients, and so it decreases the vitamin, mineral, and nutrient contents of that food. So then they add it back in to make sure we don't get deficient of those things. So the minerals and vitamins that they've added to the cereal are iron, niacinamide, vitamin B6, vitamin B2, vitamin B1, folic acid, vitamin D3, vitamin B12. So all of those, except for the D3 and the B12, are present in a whole intact grain believe it or not. So go back and watch some of those reels or follow me on Instagram so that you can be informed of things like that. Okay, so let's do another example. Let's start with corn. So whole form of corn is just your corn on the cob. Delicious, right? It's intact. You can pull, you can walk up to a corn stalk, pull it off, and you can start eating it then if you wanted to, you know? Of course, a lot of people cook it or roast it or do things with it, but you could, you could technically eat it. Now, an example of minimally processed would be uh, popcorn. And you take the dried kernel and you heat it up and it pops and you're changing some of the protein structure, but you ha haven't really added anything to it. Let's just say you did an air pop popcorn, you didn't add anything to it, you didn't take anything away from it. It's a minimally processed food. A lot of people even consider it a whole food, but it's pretty close, you know, because you didn't change much about it. Moderately processed, I have an example here of corn flour tortillas. And the reason I consider that moderately processed is because you are making the dried corn kernels into a flour, and then you're adding a few ingredients. You might be adding some lemon or uh, lime and some salt, and then you're making that into a tortilla. But really, it's not that bad. Corn tortillas are pretty health promoting, you know? Ultra processed, how about some flaming hot Cheetos or flaming hot Cheetos? Excuse me, make sure I pronounce those correctly. Very common, takis is another example, very common food that people eat. And yes, the first ingredient is enriched cornmeal. Remember what that means. If you see the word enriched, that means they had to take a bunch of stuff out of that whole grain. They had to refine it in order for it to be more shelf stable so it can last longer on the shelf and they can make this product. So the first ingredient in rich cornmeal, the second ingredient, vegetable oil. Then we got some flaming Hot seasoning, which includes monosodium glutamate, red 40, yellow six, lake, yellow six, yellow five. 
and a bunch of other stuff and really long words. So this is an ultra processed food. You can only make it in the factory. It's got a concoction lab created ingredients to make them this bright orange, attractive color and give it this really hyper palatable flavor that you cannot find in nature. Okay. So those, that's the difference between a whole food and a processed food. And I gave you some examples leading up to like the most intact whole food to the ultra processed. Okay. So believe it or not, children in our country are acquiring 70% of their calories, seven zero, okay? 70% of their calories from ultra processed food. 70% of their calories are coming from ultra processed food. That means they're having Apple Jacks at breakfast. They're having Takis or Flamin' Hot Cheetos at lunch. They're having, you know, whatever. I can't even think of stuff, but you know what I'm talking about. These are these factory created ultra processed foods, lots of added sugars, lots of added fats, artificial colors and ingredients, and 70% of our little kids in this country, that's where they're getting their calories, okay? So why should we eat more whole plant foods? I'm gonna give you two big reasons, two main reasons. And the first one is my favorite F word, which is fiber, okay? Fiber is so important. A definition from the mayoclinic.org, also known as roughage or bulk, it includes the parts of plant foods your body can't digest or absorb. Unlike other food components, such as fats, proteins, or carbohydrates, which your body breaks down and absorbs, fiber isn't digested by your body. Instead, it passes relatively intact through your stomach, small intestine, and colon and out of your body. Okay, so if you look at that definition, you're thinking, oh, well, it doesn't seem like fiber does much. It doesn't seem very important. It seems like this tiny little thing that you don't need because it just goes through and you don't absorb it, but it is so important. And I'm just gonna go and tell you about the different reasons why I love fiber. There's so many. Everybody knows that fiber keeps you regular and helps you go to the bathroom. I think everybody knows that. So that's very, very important. You know that roughage helps bring water into the colon and helps you have soft, easy to pass stools. Great thing, okay? I love pooping, I will say. And I'm a super pooper now, even though I wasn't the first 30 years of my life. So very proud of that. That's very important. The other thing that makes a big difference when we're eating whole plant foods that are high in fiber is that when fiber binds with water, when it mixes with water, it creates bulk in our stomach as well. And when it does that, it helps give us satiety. It helps us feel full. And in turn, what that does is it causes us to eat less calories, even though we're feeling as satisfied as we would be on more calories. The opposite is true of ultra processed foods. And they've done studies on this. They've done controlled studies where they put people in these metabolic labs and test how much they're eating and how their bodies are changing. The people that eat ultra processed foods need more food to feel full, to feel satisfied than the people that are eating whole foods. And a lot of that has to do with the fiber. And remember that fiber is combining with the water. It's giving us bulk, it's giving us satiety. Okay, that's reason number two. Reason number three is because fiber helps clear out our bloodstream. So basically what it's doing with the help of the liver is that it is binding to excess cholesterols, excess hormones, those kinds of things. And then we are excreting that with our waste. And so that is how the soluble fiber, which is present in a lot of plant foods, but the example that's given a lot is oats, can help decrease our cholesterol. Beans do the same thing, okay? But it can also help us balance our hormones if you're interested in that, check out my podcast episode with Dr. Neil Barnard about his book, Body and Balance, very good. And so he explains this very well. So that's the third reason. So that's how it's health promoting in that way. 
But the fourth reason, the fourth amazing, incredible reason is fiber is the food for our gut microbiome. That is what they eat. So if we want to foster, if we want to support, if we want to protect those bugs in our gut that outnumber us by a factor of 10, outnumber our human cells by a factor of 10, we have to feed them fiber. And fiber is what keeps them happy. And Ideally, a variety of different plant fibers, which means that we should eat a variety of different whole plant foods. Now, why is that important? Is because our gut microbiome works with us symbiotically. It can also harm us if we're fostering and we're supporting a set of bugs that aren't good for us. But if we're giving them fiber, then we're supporting the good bugs and they give feedback to our body. They help protect us, decrease our risk of heart disease and help us feel good, keep our gut healthy. And our gut is so important. It's part of our immune system. It can even affect our mood. It's so incredible. And we're learning more and more about that gut microbiome. So those are the four reasons. One, it helps you go poop. Two, keeps you full and satisfied. Three, it removes toxins, excess things from your blood, like cholesterol and hormones. And four, it feeds your gut microbiome. Fiber is only found in plants. Fiber is only found in plants. There is zero fiber in anything that comes from an animal. So eggs, dairy, meat, any of those things have no fiber. If they have no fiber, they are doing none of those things we just talked about, okay? All right, so pop quiz. Which food category has the highest fiber content? Is it fruits, vegetables, eggs, or beans? I'll give them to you again. Fruits, vegetables, eggs, or beans? The answer is beans. Beans have your biggest bang for your buck. At seven grams of fiber per serving on average, a serving of beans is about half a cup. They are your biggest bang for your buck when it comes to fiber. And that's why I'm a bean pusher. I push the beans because beans are just amazing. All right. And this is a beautiful picture for those of you watching on YouTube getting close to lunch right now as I'm recording this. And this is a delicious looking bean chili stew with some cilantro. Oh my gosh, there's at least three different kinds of beans in there. It looks amazing. I'm hungry. All right, so the second reason why we should eat more whole plant foods is nutrient density. Specifically, I'm talking about antioxidants, phytonutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Whole plant foods all the different whole plant foods are nutrient dense and more nutrient dense compared to animal products. And obviously the whole forms are more nutrient dense compared to the processed or ultra processed forms. Cause like I was explaining before, when you are ultra processing something, the more you process it, the more you take things away and add things that have been refined that do not have as much nutrient density. So you wanna stick to the whole plant foods. And antioxidants specifically help decrease our risk of acute and chronic disease. So acute disease means things like colds and flus and things like that. And they help support our body, all the functions of our body and make sure that we don't get nutrient deficient in a very delicious way. So another question for you, which food category has the greatest antioxidant concentration? Is it beans, leafy greens, berries, or herbs and spices, okay? Which has the greatest antioxidant concentration? Beans, leafy greens, berries, or herbs and spices? All right, well, the truth is all of these foods are very nutrient dense, but the correct answer is herbs and spices. Isn't that amazing? And it makes sense because you're making it into a powder or you know it's a very potent thing. So that's why it's important to Add, it, add a variety of different herbs and spices to our foods, but beans, leafy greens, berries, they're all packed with antioxidants. So you cannot go wrong eating any whole plant food, okay? You cannot go wrong eating whole plant foods. They are going to be high in fiber. They are going to be high in nutrient density. 
all right? And they're beautiful. They're so colorful and delicious. I love my food. So there's nutrients present in all whole plant foods. And the next question I usually get is what about protein? Well, what about protein? <laughs> Let's talk about that. Okay, which food category does not contain protein? Fruit, vegetables, whole grains, mushrooms, or none of the above? Which food category does not contain protein? Fruit, vegetables, whole grains, mushrooms, or none of the above? Well, I hope that if you've been listening to this podcast long enough, you know that all whole plant foods have protein. They just have it in various percentages, varying percentages, okay? So all whole plant foods have protein. So you don't have to worry about that. As long as you are eating an adequate amount of calories from a variety of different whole plant foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, you will be obtaining sufficient protein. Not to worry. Okay, but there's also so many health benefits of eating a whole food plant-based diet. We started this presentation talking about chronic disease and how we die of preventable chronic disease. So whenever we're eating a diet that is high in fiber, that's high in antioxidants and phytonutrients and vitamins and minerals, we are decreasing our risk of chronic disease, including heart disease, like high blood pressure, like heart attacks, like strokes, those kinds of things, diabetes, especially when we talk about diabetes that is caused by insulin resistance that happens or develops over time. Dementia. So a lot of people don't realize that dementia is something that we might be able to decrease our risk of depending on what type of dementia it is. And even once we have gotten dementia, if we adopt healthy lifestyle habits at that point, we might be able to slow down the progression. Autoimmune diseases even. There's so many health benefits of eating a whole food plant-based diet, but also it just feels good. Your digestion is running well. You have lots of energy. You're sleeping good. You're able to do the activities you want to do just by eating more whole plant foods. So the question is, a plant-based diet has the potential to reverse heart disease and diabetes. Can a plant-based diet reverse heart disease and diabetes? Is that true or false? What do you think? Has that happened? Can that happen? Yes, it's possible. Now, not every person that has these conditions is able to reverse their disease process, but many people are at minimum able to decrease the amount of medications that they're on which is also a big deal. And remember that number one reason that I have is also it's going to increase well-being. So even if you have a chronic disease, feeling better every day, being able to do the activities that you want to do, hang out with your kids, hang out with your loved ones, that is reason enough. But there's more. And the reason that I gave this presentation when I did and titled it the way I did is because we're dealing with something else. We're dealing with something that has changed our lives dramatically, has caused us to think about things so different. And that is the COVID-19 pandemic that we've been in. This study recently came out a few months ago it is in the BMJ, British Medical Journal, entitled Plant-Based Diets, Pescatarian Diets, and COVID-19 Severity, a Population-Based Case Control Study in Six Countries. And what they did is that they actually surveyed health professionals. They found out what type of diet they ate and then correlated that with COVID infection. So whether they didn't get an infection, whether they got mild, moderate, or severe infection from COVID, and they were able to find that those people that reported that were they were eating a plant-based diet, and what's interesting about 
about it is that some of them, they were not 100% plant-based. They were eating some animal products, but it was mostly plant-based. They were able to decrease their risk or they were less likely to develop moderate and severe COVID by 73%, 73%. And the people eating the pescatarian diet were able to have less moderate to severe COVID by 59% compared to everybody else, okay? So that's powerful, that is so powerful. And obviously this is a study that's a case control study, so it's not as controlled as you would do a clinical trial or something like that. But we're able to see some associations here. We're able to see some correlations that hopefully help you see how powerful these choices are when it comes to what we eat, what we put in our bodies. And remember, we're eating three to seven times per day. So being a little bit more thoughtful about what we're eating. Can you eat more whole plant foods that have fiber, that have antioxidants, that have these phytonutrients that are gonna help you not only feel good, but decrease your risk of getting acute and chronic disease? And it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Like I just said in that study, when I read it and I saw what the they were reporting for their diets, those people that endorsed a plant-based diet were still eating some animal products. They were eating a little bit. So if you, whenever you think there's no way I can go vegan or plant-based and you just get this intense fear in your chest and you're wanting to run away and you know just go all or nothing, please don't. Please just think about how can I add more whole plant foods into my diet and how can I make it feel amazing? Eat like a centenarian. I've talked about the blue zones before. These are places around the world where people are living long, healthy lives into their 90s and 100s. Look it up if you haven't heard of it. It's wonderful. They have so many healthy habits and they're not going to gyms. They're not going to famous vegan restaurants. They live in these small villages. They're eating predominantly plant-based diets. They're eating animal products occasionally. One to, one to four times per month, usually in celebration and usually as a garnish, not as the main part of the meal. They're eating beans, they're moving their bodies as part of their lives, they're integrating movement into their lives with things like walking to where they need to go, gardening, things like that. They're connecting with others. So these are wonderful lifestyle medicine habits and behaviors that we know decrease our risk of chronic disease but these people are not vegan. They don't consider themselves vegan. They're just eating that way because that's what's available to them. That's how they grew up. That's their culture. So eat like a centenarian. And I also want to remind you that eating plants is about abundance, not deprivation. I hear over and over and over again, well, a vegan diet, it's restrictive. A plant-based diet, it's restrictive. Really? Is it really though? Can we examine how truthful that is. How many animals do we eat? Or how many animal secretions or products do we eat? Usually between eight or 10. And I think 10 is on the side of people that are more adventurous. Because there are some people that don't eat goat and lamb and, and those kinds of things. In our country, probably closer to more like five to eight different things. You're maybe eating egg. So the egg is coming from a chicken. It's not coming from a different bird. Chicken egg, cow milk, which maybe it's milk, yogurt, cheese, ice cream, but that's just one thing, okay? Probably cow muscle, so hamburgers and steaks and things like that, bacon, maybe some pork, maybe some ham, um, turkey maybe, you know? So just between five or 10 different animals that you're eating on a regular basis, okay? Guess what? There are over 50,000 edible plants, 50,000 edible plants in our world. And what we have available to us in this country, it's still in the thousands. So a thousand different plants versus eight to 10 animals. That is not restriction. Yes, we have to work on our culture. We need to work on what we offer at restaurants and things like that, even what's offered at grocery stores because sometimes there's not as much variety and diversity at some grocery stores. But the truth is, it's not about deprivation. It's about abundance. So don't focus on what you're not eating. Don't focus on 
not choosing something, focus more on what you can choose. Be excited about it. Have you ever eaten oat groats? Have you ever eaten the most whole form of wheat, wheat berries? Have you ever eaten quinoa? And I'm stuck on the whole grains right now. But And there's also 400 different edible beans. Is there a bean you've never tried? Fruits, there's so many, thousands of different fruits, thousands and thousands of different vegetables. Try something new and get excited about it. Get excited about trying different ways to prepare it different sauces and different spices and different herbs you can cook with. And think in your mind, abundance, 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 not deprivation. Don't focus on eliminating things, focus on adding things. Focus on adding these life-giving, health-promoting foods that are full of fiber, full of antioxidants that are going to help you live that long, healthy life that you desire. It is about abundance, not deprivation. In closing, I wanna give you some ideas, especially if this is new to you. I remember when I first made the transition to a plant-based diet over 10 years ago, I didn't know anybody else who ate like this, and my brain was still not open to all the different foods because I just wasn't familiar with it. I just, my paradigm was different. I didn't think in this way. So I wanna close out with some examples of foods that you can eat starting today that are plant-based, delicious, filling, etc. So for breakfast, here's three ideas. My favorite of all time, oatmeal with fruit and nuts. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. There's all different kinds of processing of oatmeal. So if you like the more processed oatmeal or you want to do the oat groats, add some fruit, add some plant milk. I love mine with peanut butter, but walnuts is also something I love. Or simply with how I started on my journey is I just started whole grain toast and I put some peanut butter on it. But now we have so many nut butters available in the grocery store. So you can do almond butter, you can do cashew butter. Of course, you could do some jam, have a side of fruit, Vegetable and bean scramble, so easy. Look at the vegetables you have in the fridge. If you have a can of black beans, saute all of that together, put it in a tortilla if you want, or have it with a side of fruit if you like the savory breakfast. Let's talk about lunches. Hummus sandwich with veggies and a side of fruit. Hummus is so popular. Now they have like a bazillion different types of hummus and flavors. So get some whole grain bread, put some hummus on there, put your favorite fruits, maybe some shredded carrot, some spinach leaves, some red bell pepper slices, make it nice and crunchy and yummy, and then have it with some fruit. It's so delicious, it's so nourishing. Bean burrito, you can find that almost anywhere. Or a Buddha bowl. And basically a Buddha bowl, you can also call that a grain bowl. So you start out with grains, add some leafy greens, put some type of legume on there, put your veggies, put a delicious sauce or some avocado. You are set to go. It's so filling, so satisfying. For dinner, How about a tofu and veggie stir fry with brown rice? If you're scared of tofu and you're intimidated, use chickpeas, my favorite bean. So that's another option. All the veggies you like, serve it with some brown rice, delicious. Pasta primavera, very delicious. I make this all the time. Some pasta, lots of veggies with it, and your red sauce. It's so good. You can top it with some nutritional yeast if you want or everybody's favorite burger, but this time a veggie burger with roasted potatoes, or you can air fry some potatoes, make them crispy, and add that with some ketchup, it's so good. When it comes to snack, fruit is always available and accessible, and you can find that almost anywhere. Some fresh veggies with hummus, roasted chickpeas, I love those. There's so many different snacks that you can have. Um, My husband went to Trader Joe's yesterday and they have these little single pack olives. That's plant-based, filling, delicious, satisfying. It's easy. So things like that, be creative, think about it. 
So I want you to start, if you are ready to go on this journey, if you are ready to include more nourishing, life-giving, health-promoting foods into your life, how can you start to integrate more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, and nuts and seeds into your meals and snacks starting today? Don't even wait till tomorrow because you don't have to. There's probably more available to you than you ever realized. How can you do that starting today? Remember, abundance, abundance, abundance. Taste more things, try more things, be curious, approach it with curiosity, approach it with a sense of fun and adventure. And how can you do that starting today? All right, so then I wanna know from you, I want you to really answer this in your head. Now that I know this information that Dr. Yami has shared with me, I, one, will make an effort to eat more whole plant foods, or two, maybe I'm gonna go fully plant-based and I'm gonna try this out and see how it goes. Or three, make no changes because your diet is essentially perfect. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Even my diet I don't consider perfect because there's no such thing as a perfect diet. And remember, life is dynamic. There's changes that are thrown to us all the time. There's life changes. We may fall off of our habits sometime. Maybe you're in a slump right now and you wanna get back to this plant-based eating. It's okay, you're not a failure. It's not all or nothing. What do you wanna do? You wanna eat more whole plant foods? You wanna go plant-based? Or are you not ready to change? What do you think? Remember that there's free downloads available, dryami.com forward slash free. Of course, you're listening to my podcast right now, so thank you so much, I appreciate you. And for those of you that are new to my podcast or this was shared to you from a friend or family, I have a book, it's called A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy. It's available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all your major online booksellers. So thank you so much. You can find me on Instagram at the Dr. Yami. I am so grateful that you listened to this episode. I hope it was helpful. You can always email me yami at dryami.com if you have questions or you have ideas for any other shows. I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.